of this uh, conference, the civil wars and civil society in the 17th century. We're starting off with a fresh young PhD from Glasgow, one of Stephen Reid's students. No, Karen. Pardon? Karen. Oh, sorry, Ben. Pardon. People were lying to me. <laughs> um, we're going to be hearing about uh, Scottish royalism and the myth of Scottish royalism in the British Civil Wars. Although Andrew's research is going to be covering royalism right the way through from the Union of Crowns until the Revolutionary really Revolutions. And he's going to enlighten us now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just before I start, I just want to thank the organizers of the conference for allowing me to speak. It's a real honor to give a talk in front of such a star studied audience. Um, and as you may have guessed already, this afternoon I'm going to be discuss discussing royalism in Scotland during the British Civil War. And to begin, I would just like to mention an article which Kim Donald had written in 2014, which had the title of Montrose and Modern Memory. In the article, Dr. MacDonald discussed the reasons why James Graham, first Marquis of Montrose, has never attained the same level of national recognition as the, the likes of Wallace, Bruce, or even one of Prince Charlie. She concluded that the character of Montrose had been tainted within the public's perception by a level of religious partisanship within the historiography and by a post jacobite Victorian Romanticism, which seems to have come to Montrose and Royalism in general within this period. And that's thanks to the works of authors like Sir Walter Scott and more recently the young Montrose novels of Michael Tranter. I think this highlights the issues which the historical community as a whole has with Scottish Royalism. And that's that within our collective consciousness, we've come to associate royalism, particularly in Scotland, with ideas of foolish loyalty, lost causes, and in particular, the nobility. And this is often seen in the shadow of Jacobism as some kind of strange prototype of what Jacobism would go on to become. <coughs> I think this problem is compounded somewhat by Montrose himself. Often when I tell people that I'm looking at royalism in this period, without even mentioning Montrose, the first question I'm normally asked is, but what more can we possibly know about Montrose? <laughs> the answer to that question is not much. Uh, Montrose has been pretty thoroughly beaten with the historiographical back. Um, however, because we've based our knowledge of an entire movement off of one individual, if you want to look beyond Montrose, that's actually a very difficult task. I believe we've become victims of hindsight in this regard. And in the mythos that surrounds Montrose, we've lost track of just how pressing the civil wars were in Scotland. They were just that, it was a civil war. It wasn't just the personal vendetta of one man. And it's like in our efforts to see the forest, we've become distracted by the impressiveness of one particular tree whose name just happens to be Montrose. So in order to go some way to rectifying this today, I'd like to discuss a number of points. Firstly, I'd like to just talk about very briefly what royalism actually is. The natural next question following on from that is, why look at Scottish royalism? And then because of time constraints I have today, I can't provide an overall uh, or all-encompassing reanalysis of Scottish royalism. So instead, I'm going to focus on this issue of viewing royalism in Scotland as a noble one to and I hope that by doing so, I can show you some of the ways that I'm trying to reevaluate the movement. And then to, to conclude, I'll discuss my next steps in terms of research. And I'd be particularly grateful if you had any thoughts or comments in that regard. So royalism, what does it actually mean? It's one of those terms which we all feel pretty familiar with. But when we actually get down to nitpicking it, it becomes a collage of grey rather than a certain answer. At its most simplistic, a royalist was someone who supported Charles I and then later Charles II in defiance of the covenanting regime, the Irish Confederacy and the English Parliament. <coughs> However, it doesn't take much pressure for this definition to crack. It doesn't answer <coughs> questions like, what did it actually mean to be a royalist? What was their ideology? Was there a royalist culture? Was this one group or was it a confederation of smaller groupings? Importantly, were they took the opportunists? Were they pragmatists? Or were they the committed followers of the king prerogative it all regards as a romantic player member to be? Did events change the nature of royalism? Most notably, did the 
execution of Charles I himself have an effect on the royalism which was conducted? Did the engagement, another example. So therefore, did royalism in fact change over the course of the civil wars? That last point certainly seems to be the case in other places, uh, most notably Ireland, where Robert Armstrong's conducted a study looking at Protestant communities in Ireland. And he's found that at the start of the civil wars, there was strong support for the king and royalism in general, but that that support waned over the course of the wars because the Irish Protestants didn't believe that the king or the royal party was in a strong enough position to help them in their fight against the Catholic Confederacy. Naturally, you can't just fit every royalist into a neat definitional box, no matter how much you might want to cram them in. But there's an issue in that there is no clear consensus within the historiography just now as to what exactly royalism was. Within the work that's been conducted on English royalism, uh, which has been spearheaded by the likes of Hutton, uh, sorry, Ronald Hutton, David Smith, Jason McElliott, and Barbara Donegan, there's a growing consensus that ideologically royalism was this rainbow coalition. Increasingly, the archetypal, noble, absolutist royalist is being replaced with a royalist nobility and gentry who were not just simply blindly loyal, but who had based that loyalty off of their own knowledge of continental and domestic political theory, politics, events, and even history. This portrays royalism as much more of a conservative middle ground rather than the hardcore early modern right wing that it's sometimes remembered to be. Likewise, the traditional arguments such as the court versus country debate appears to be in its last legs as it's becoming increasingly apparent that both sides of the conflict were comprised of individuals from all social and political backgrounds. In terms of a royalist culture, scholars such as Malcolm Smuts, Robert Wiltshire and James Loxley have argued that there was a tangible royalist culture in English and that they've argued that terms like cavalier, which seems to have stuck around a lot longer than the rival term of roundhead, um, are increasingly unhelpful and problematic. And they've used royalist literary works such as poetry, propaganda, verbs, to diversity in political ideology and message within such texts. Alongside this, there's been an increasing emphasis within the Civil War historiography as a whole to look at the popular or public or plebeian experience of the Civil Wars. This was initially spearheaded again <coughs> by the likes of Ronald Tutton, also David Underdown, and has most recently been taken up by Tim Harris and Mark Stoyle. In the efforts to recognize that the people were active political players in all of this, and they held their own beliefs and cultures, and they weren't just simply the pawns of greater men. So this is a particularly novel concept for royalism, which for so long has been connected with the nobility solely. We're now starting to ask questions like, how popular was royalism? How much social reach did royalism have? With all this in mind, it's clear that the simple definition just simply won't do anymore, and that we must start thinking of royalism as a political and or cultural allegiance to the king, which was politically and socially varied. With all this promising new research that's been conducted in England on royalism, you'd be quite within your rights to ask, well, why are you looking at Scottish royalism? Well, today, we haven't looked at Scottish royalism. There is only one monograph which discusses royalism in Scotland during the Civil Wars, and that's uh, Barry Robertson's Royalists of War in Scotland and Ireland, 1630 to 1650, which was published in 2014. Robertson's study follows the fates of the royalist campaigns in Scotland and Ireland and provides a comparison of them both. And while it provides an invaluable narrative, which it was much needed, he answers the questions of who and when and largely steers clear of questions of why. Why is why so important? Well, almost every textbook which talks about the civil wars in Scotland at some point mentions this idea that there was a strong monarchical culture in Scotland and the issues which absentee monarchy post-1603 brought to the country, which had for so long based its society and even identity off of the Stuart monarchy. This is often used to explain the close connection between the early covenanting ideology and the monarchy, without exploring the other side, that is, those who remained loyal to Charles I. From the covenanting side of things, I'm pleased to say that thanks to the kind of work that's been conducted by Jamie McDougall of the University of Glasgow, we're now starting to question this relationship between the 
Covenanters and Royalists in Scotland, that it's becoming increasingly apparent that there's a lot of grey areas between the two. Despite this, and despite the incredible amount of research that's been done on late medieval Scotland and kingship, which members of the audience have contributed to, very little work has been done to uncover how civil warrior Scots saw themselves in relation to the monarchy. This leads into the question of the social appeal of royalism, which has been particularly neglected in the Scottish context. In fact, in Royalist of War, Robertson states that there simply isn't the scope in Scotland to conduct a study into popular royalism. The problem with a statement like that is that it reinforces <coughs> those old stereotypes. Indeed, whilst the covenanting revolution, as it's sometimes called, is often associated with popular action and even national identity, Scottish royalism is often seen as a marginal and popular noble grumbling, which really only came to prominence through the sheer brilliance of Montrose's generalship or his sheer dumb luck, depending on who said the French is set If the local studies which Stoyle and Under, Under, sorry, Underdown and uh, Hutton and Armstrong have conducted have proven anything, it's that people were just as complex then as they are now and that regional contexts and cultures could be the difference in allegiance in, during the civil wars. And so our first task and our path to reevaluate royalism should be to debunk these unhealthy stereotypes which have lingered far too long in the historiography. The most problematic of these stereotypes is the belief that royalism was a noble lost cause. And I'd like to break that down into its two elements. So first the noble and as previously mentioned, in England there's a growing push to look at the everyday person's experience of the civil wars, as far as the source material will allow. In Mark Stowe's study, for example, he used a vast array of source materials from personal testimony, pamphlets, correspondences, <coughs> and local records, and that was in depth. The reason that Robertson was so negative on the prospect of conducting a similar study in Scotland was that for some reason we just simply aren't blessed with the same level of primary source material. <coughs> to add to this problem that the Covenanting regime was able to seize control of Scotland very quickly at the start of the conflict, and importantly they took control of every press press in the kingdom, with the slight exception of Aberdeen, which was between hands during the course of the civil wars. That meant that the type of tin culture which has been so important within the English historiography for finding out things like public culture and popular allegiance simply just isn't available to us. <coughs> the Covenanters would also have been in the ideal situation to repress any forms of public royalist sentiment, particularly in the lowlands where we have the largest concentrations of population, simply because that's where their grip was tightest. So what does that mean? <coughs> well, we have a small amount of royalist pamphlets from the Bishop Wars, which were published in Scotland. We have official tracts, which were also published, uh, notably Walter Bockenholm's large declaration. It should be there, but it's not. <laughs> and we have official records, such as uh, borough records and parliamentary records. Little to no work has been done with these in relation to finding royalism. And having really only stuck my toe in, I'm starting to find things that don't fit that noble model. For example, in the Glasgow Borough Records for December 1646, so this is over a year after Montrose's crushing of the defeat at the Philbond in 1645, the records show that one James Bell and one Colin Campbell were sent to the Edinburgh Toll Booth by Order of Parliament for inciting a, quote, an audible convocation of the multitude, end quote, against the Presbytery for its actions against members of the town council who it deemed had cooperated with the rebels that being the royalist when they occupied Glasgow. Now this isn't explicitly a royalist riot, but I think it nicely demonstrates just how muddy the waters were during the civil wars, and suggests that there's more to the story. In order to access that and somewhat bypass the lack of source material, I've been trying to trace the development of Scottish monarchical culture from the late medieval period into the civil wars. To do that, I've been examining records of celebrations of the monarchy within wider society, which have included records for thanksgivings, royal entries, and public celebrations. <coughs> and it's clear from these that the monarchy was still very much in vogue in Scotland. To provide an example, when Charles I finally returns to Scotland in 1633 to receive his Scottish coronation, 
he performs what's called the Royal Touch at Hollywood Palace. Now, the Royal Touch <coughs> is a very English and French ritual whereby the monarch would literally touch a person afflicted with the king's evil or scrofula, thereby divinely healing them. And part of this ritual would normally be included uh, an act of charity from the monarch, which would take the form of the monarch giving a medal or a coin or a touch piece to the person. Now, these touch pieces were often kept because they were seen to have uh, absorbed some of the divine magical powers which the monarch had. So keeping that in mind, James Balfour, the uh, contemporary writer and historian, records that Charles, in one sitting in Hollywood, touches over 100 people. This in of itself is an interesting embodiment of that link between divinity and monarchy within the public sphere. sphere sorry. Um, but what is most startling is the survival of touch pieces from the 1633 tour. Now, the sheer survival of these pieces suggests that over the course of Charles's relatively brief tour in 1633, that he touched upwards of 2,000 people. It's very difficult to assess things like the distances people were willing to travel to see the king, but the fact that a piece from 1633 was still being used to heal ailments in Sharon in the 19th century provides tantalizing food for thought. Indeed, there are more mundane examples, such as whilst Charles is in Edinburgh performing this royal touch, Aberdeen is awash with the borough-wide celebrations. Thanksgiving services were held in the Kirk, the market cross was adorned in tapestries, bonfires were lit, the king was toasted, and celebratory volleys of musket and cannon fire were shot. <coughs> So despite being far removed from the king's person, and keep in mind that Scotland hadn't seen its reigning monarch since James VI's last visit in 1617, the king was obviously still very important to the everyday people in Scotland. And this begs the question, where does this go? Does it simply vanish with the signing of the National Covenant in 1638, or does something more complex happen here? Unfortunately, I don't have the final answer to that. I um, hope I will in three to four years. Um, but it does appear that there's more to the story than it's not been told. Another tag which is often attached to royalism in Scotland is the fact that it was often seen as a lost cause and that the royalists never really had any real hope of achieving victory. I think this is an issue of perception rather than fact. And like I mentioned before, this relates to the problems which hindsight has brought us. <coughs> Without getting into too much of a what if kind of discussion, I think it's useful just to remind ourselves of a couple of important factors. The first being the issue of monarchism, sorry, monarchism, monarchism within the covenantal regime. That is, support for the crown, if not necessarily Charles I. And this is the, the murky waters problem. From its outset, the covenant was a defensive document which took great care in discussing uh, loyalty to the crown. And so you need to look no further than one of the many covenanting banners which went with the army down to the north of England. Uh, this is an example of the National Museum of Scotland, which reads, For religion, king, and kingdoms. We know that Charles was eventually executed, but if you were to tell the men who had signed the National Covenant in that fateful day in Grey Fires that by them signing the covenant that would in some way attribute to this outcome, they would have been horrified, just like many of them were horrified when it did actually happen. How much did it matter that the Covenanters were simply faster to organise than the Royalists in Scotland? And could Charles I have, and the Royalist leadership, have harnessed monarchism more effectively in Scotland? The fragility of Covenanter control is something else which is historically been ignored, because culturally the Covenant has been endowed with the central position within Scottish Presbyterian national identity. And this ignores the fears of covenanters like Robert Bailey, who wrote to his cousin in 1644, pleading for God's help, as he was terrified that Prince Rupert was going to march north and destroy the Covenanter army which was based in the north of England. That would, of course, left Scotland open to the likes of Huntley, Montrose, and Antrim to reclaim the kingdom for the king. As things go, that didn't happen. But because we know the outcome, we sometimes forget just how uncertain things were in this period. Therefore, I believe that we, we must start treating royalism as a movement which has a tangible threat and not merely as a sideshow of the period. Now, I hope that this um, whistle-stop tour of royalism 
in Scotland has shown you some of the ways that I'm trying to reevaluate the movement. In essence, I'm going back to basics and that I'm putting the question of allegiance into the Scottish context. And whilst I've only been doing this for a relatively short period of time, I'm already finding things which don't fit the current narrative. In regards to my next steps, I'm planning on exploring personal correspondences between royalists in order to find those ideological and cultural similarities. Uh, I'm also keen to look for more evidence of popular royalism, as I'm sure is more profound. And finally, I'm eager to provide a national analysis of royalism in Scotland, and that will include incorporating uh, materials from the Highlands as well as the Lowlands to find those regional variations and similarities. I'm keen to hear your own thoughts on this, and thank you very much for listening.